Hello, good morning. And Mabrika, that's the new word I learned today. And it is a great honor and pleasure for me to welcome this morning in our in this session, the Kalinago journey, 1492 to present, a living museum. We have with us today uh, a very special group of people working and thriving to promote the Kalinago heritage, continuing with this journey. Our next presentation will be followed by a live Q&A with the presenters. And now let's go on to our recorded session. I'd especially like to thank the Ayo, Ayaora Community of Excellences, Yvonne Armour, thank you for your dedication. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your support. Let's go into our recorded session right now. Mabrika and welcome. Sitting next to me is former Kalinago chief, Irvins Ogis. My name is Vince Ogis Francois and will be your moderators this morning. The Ivora Communities of Excellence Foundation Inc. is honored to present the distinguished voices from the Caribbean's last remaining indigenous Kalinago community at this year's conference. This 75-minute panel discussion includes a question and answer segment. We focus on Kalinago perspective on resilience and sustainability. Within the context of this year's conference theme, Cultivating Resilience in Museums and Cultural Heritage Sites. We will now begin our discussions with a blessing from our shaman, Gerard.
first presenter, Nichi Abo. Nichi Abo, born as Louis Patrick Hill, is a US Army veteran, holds a master's degree in public administration from the University of the US Virgin Islands, and a bachelor's degree from the University of Maryland in politics and management. He served as a US Virgin Islands Senator for 10 years, holding also the positions of Vice President and President of the Senate. Nietzsche was born on Whitey Kubli in what was then called the Car Carib Reserve and has returned home to Iwasi. In his retirement, he engages as a Kalinago cultural activist, farmer, and tourism entrepreneur and seeks to educate and share the wisdom, culture, and time-tested resiliency practices of his Kalinago ancestors. Welcome, Nichi Abu. Mabrika, may the ancestors be honored. I make this presentation understanding that my knowledge of this subject is far from extensive, that my perspective is from the tiny window of my life experiences, but most of all, from my deep emotional yearning for a future that celebrates the sacrifices of not only the Kalinago, but of all indigenous peoples. A future that brings us full circle to the relationship we once had with this living planet. I wish to begin my, this presentation with a quote from a papal bull issued by Pope Nicholas V on January 8, 1455, and reissued by Pope Alexander VI on May 4th, 1493. Quote, to invade, search out, capture, vanquish, and subdue all Saracens and pagans whatsoever, and other enemies of Christ wheresoever placed and the kingdoms, principalities, dominions, possessions, and all movable and immovable goods whatsoever held and possessed by them, and to reduce their persons to perpetual slavery, and to convert them to his use and profit and to possess these lands, harbors, and areas, and they do of right belong and pertain to the said king and his successors." End of quote. This racist and ethnocentric legal document is the basis upon which Europeans and later Americans, Canadians, Australians, and even the government of Belize has used to steal the lands and possessions of indigenous peoples. Distinguished scholars Russell Thornton and David Stannard, based on extensive research, have estimated that when Columbus, lost at sea, drifted into the waters of the Western Hemisphere, approximately 75 to 100 million people and 300 nations occupied this geographic space. The Catholic Church, European, and later the American government, in the name of Jesus Christ and Christianity, used the doctrine of discovery to create a policy designed to enslave indigenous people and to steal their lands. David Stannard writes, and I quote, the near total destruction of the Western Hemisphere's native people was 
was neither inadvertent nor inevitable, end of quote. He goes on to say that the number of deaths caused by European colonization constitutes, and I quote again, the worst human holocaust the world has ever witnessed, end of quote. There are those who would deny the genocidal intent of the colonizers, but the facts are clear and the evidence is overwhelming. There has been significant debate about the number of indigenous people living in the island of Kiskeya, which is Hispaniola. And numbers range from 300,000 to over a million when Columbus landed there on December 5, 1492. What has absolutely never been questioned is the fact that by 1531, a mere 39 years later, the population was literally extinct. In an article titled Pre-Columbian Hispaniola by Yale University, it states, and I quote, the only case in history of where complete and total genocide was carried out was here on the island of Hispaniola. The entire gens the whole people of the Native Americans and the Arawak slash Taino were wiped out. It is a horrible and astonishing story." End of quote. Bartolome de las Casas, a conquistador turned priest, wrote, and I quote, the men made bets as to who would split a man in two, or cut off his head in one blow, or they opened up his bowels. They tore the babes from their mother's breasts and by their feet and dashed their heads against the rocks. And here's the kicker. And by 13s, in honor and reverence of our Redeemer and the 12 apostles, they put wood underneath, and with fire, they burned the Indians alive. Do we have a museum that depicts this horror, like the Holocaust Museum depicts the Jewish Holocaust? We do have a museum, however, called the Columbus Lighthouse, built to honor and celebrate Christopher Columbus and to purportedly house his remains, which, by the way, DNA results have placed in the Cathedral of Seville. Think about that. The attempted Jewish genocide by the German Nazis pales in comparison to the Holocaust of indigenous people in the Western Hemisphere. This raises the question of why the Jewish Holocaust is so renowned and the indigenous Holocaust is only a footnote, even in the region where it occurred. I have chosen to begin this presentation with this graphic look at the horror endured by our indigenous ancestors. Because the Kalinago journey is but a chapter in this gruesome history. Historians have written that the Kalinago tribe occupied the lands from St. Croix in the north to Trinidad in the south, where the monument of Hyrema stands as a testament to the indomitable spirit of the Kalinago. More recently, archaeological findings seem to confirm Columbus's writings that the Kalinago were present in Jamaica, in Hispaniola, and the Bahamas. Two facts seem to weave an unbroken thread in the written European account of Kalinago history. Number one. They were warriors. 
who refused to be enslaved, and who at every juncture courageously fought to defend their lands, possessions, and their families. Two, they were brilliant seafaring people. And they moved freely and frequently between the islands in huge dugout canoes using the constellation as their compass. Their courage, physical prowess, and fearlessness in all adversity and even death has earned them the title of warlike. The same qualities, however, have earned the Greek warrior Achilles godlike status in history. Duterte writes, and I quote, what happened to the English governor of Montserrat shows clearly the prodigious aversion which this nation, the Carib, have to servitude. It was impossible for him to subdue them. And though he loaded them with heavy chains, they nevertheless dragged them to the seaside to seize any canoe to carry them back to their homes. So, seeing their obstinacy, he had their eyes put out. But this rigor availed him nothing for the preferred being left to die of grief and hunger to living as slaves. History does not give an account of the Kalinago population when Columbus arrived in this region. But in 1903, after 400 years of struggle, British administrator Heskiff Bell writes, and I quote, the hundred years of peace and protection have arrested almost at the last gasp the extinction of this interesting remnant of the world's races, end of quote. Yet we survive, and as long as the blood of our ancestors run through our veins, and their memory throbs in our hearts, the struggle will continue. I have a few recommendations what Mac may wish to consider. Number one, encourage governments in the region to review their laws, regulations, and policies that impact indigenous people and repeal those that are based on the prejudices and fallacies of the doctrine of discovery. Two. Stop using the word discovery to describe the theft of land and murder of indigenous people. Three, systematically incorporate the words genocide and holocaust into the lexicon of Mac to describe the slaughter of millions of indigenous people. Four, Advocate for an international level, at an international level, for the return of cultural and religious artifacts stolen during colonization. Five, advocate for and commission where possible throughout the Caribbean, monuments honoring the Kalinago people for their blood and sacrifice in defense of these islands. Six, lobby the Pope and the Catholic Church to rescind, renounce, and dismantle the, the doctrine of discovery. In conclusion, it is my observation that the majority of museums in the Caribbean are fashioned on the European model of presenting artifacts in a cold and dispassionate way. That is appropriate for the Europeans, 
because they cannot tell the true stories of the artifacts without exposing their inhumanity. Caribbean museums must chart a new course. You must tell the graphic story of our journey, not the whitewashed European version. Our museums must do what the Holocaust Museum does, ensure that the world never forgets the atrocities of European colonization. Thank you. Thank you, Nishi Abu, for a wonderful presentation. We will now introduce our other panelists. Senator Annette Sanford is a wife, mother, and farmer, and served as an opposition member of parliament. She obtained a postgraduate certificate in healthcare administration from the St. Lawrence College in Canada, a bachelor's degree in nursing from the University of Edinburgh, and an associate de of arts degree from the Dominica State College. She entered the political arena after working for 11 years as a registered nurse in Dominica and contested but lost the Cayenago chief elections by three votes in 2019. She currently owns and operates the Natari Care Services, which offers vocational training to caregivers. Welcome, Senator Sanford. Mabrika, it's a pleasure to be here today to speak on the topic Contribution of Women and Children to Kalinago Sustainability and Resilience. Kalinago women are often referred to as the keepers of tradition. They play a significant role in keeping our traditional dances, culinary arts, language, and alternative forms of medicine, and they have kept this alive for generations. The sustenance of our traditional knowledge has contributed to the resilience and resistance of complete assimilation and has been passed down to children through generations. Museums play a critical role in ensuring that this accurate information is recorded and shared with the wider world. The Kalinago people currently occupy a 3,700 acre of communal land designated to them in 1903. But prior to that, we occupied a 134 acre of land that was set aside in Salibia. The population currently is about 3,000 individuals. The 2011 census from the Statistical Division of Dominica says that Kalinago men comprise of at least 56.5% and the Kalinago female population consists of 43.5%. There are four public schools within the Kalinago territory and one private school. All schools, with the exception of the private schools, have female principals, with three of them having Kalinago women principals. We have the Sineco Primary School, Mrs. John Lewis, as you can see in the photo, we also have the Salibir Primary School, headed by Mrs. Bell, and the Atkinson Primary School, Miss John. So these are our three Kalinago female principals. There are also other Kalinago women who currently hold leadership positions at the national level as well. In the photo here, we have our first Kalinago female registrar, Mrs. Vincia Auguste Francois. And we also have our first Kalinago magistrate, Miss Pearl Williams. The territory on a whole has played its part towards achieving the United Nations Gender Equity Sustainable Development Goal number five. Currently, women continue to be actively engaged in many areas of development. There are women farmers, women teachers, women nurses, women lawyers, women researchers, women parliamentarians, and they continue to make their mark in this progressive world. 
The traditional view of the Kalinago woman is often seen as a caregiver and a housewife whose role is basically to care for children. And that is a misconception. History has shown that our Kalinago women have been on the forefront of leadership and have been actively engaged in the day-to-day -day running of the Kalinago community. They have been equally participating in evidence in, in activities that they, within the Kalinago community, they have often hold the fort whilst the Kalinago men would go out fishing. There were also female chief leaders in the 1600s as verbalized by our very own historian, Lennox Honichich. Also, our most recent social data collected in 2019 by the Ministry of Gender Affairs says that the majority of the households within the Kalinago territory currently are female providers. The females are the primary providers within our community. Arts and craft and Kalinago women. Our women have contributed significantly to the passing on of traditional knowledge of our arts and crafts in the past. Here in this photo is a Kalinago woman in the 1950s doing cocoa baskets. Currently, we have our Kalinago women doing Kalinago crafts in a different way, but the methodology is the same. The weaving is the same, but the style may be different. We also have this photo showing the Kalinago family going to sell baskets in 1912. We have a mother and her children. This shows that the woman usually would have her children around her whenever she do activities. And therefore, this knowledge is often passed down to children. Currently, about 80% of craft artisans in the Kalinago territory are females. The they are often very much involved in passing on information at our schools, uh, during activities within the community, and also engaging with the local government in passing on this information to community members. Women and culture. Our women and children have been very active in the passing on of cultural information in our community. Here in this picture, we have a photo of the Karifuna Cultural Group in 1982. And we can see that both women and the children were actively involved in cultural activities during those times. After the Karina, Karifuna Cultural Group, we now have the Karina Cultural Group. And this is owned by a woman, Miranda Langley, and her husband. They have been very active in conducting live performances in dance, Kalinago songs, and traditional spiritual rituals, and also showcasing our Kalinago dress. Miranda Langley is also the National Golden Drum Awards for contributing to culture. And her home currently is used to celebrate many of the cultural activities taking place in the Kalinago territory like the annual Miss Kalinago show that she initiated. Here is a photo of the Karina Cultural Village where we have a lot of cultural activities taking place in the Kalinago territory. And also here is a photo of our Kalinago women engaged in the Kalinago, Miss Kalinago show in the Kalinago territory. Here they are highlighting our Kalinago traditional dress, and oftentimes they get the opportunity to showcase their talent through using the Kalinago language and other Kalinago cultural um, aspects. Here is a photo of the Karina cultural group um, dancing and passing on the culture for dance. Women and culinary arts. Kalinago women are very active participants in displaying culture through our foods, both at a commercial level and also they practice it at home. 
Here in this photo, we have a woman engaged in culinary arts food preparation for commercial purposes. As you know, the cassava bread is one of our cultural foods. And currently, we do have cassava factories within the Kalinago territory that showcase our foods. We also have currently the Tilu Kanawa, which is a restaurant that was newly opened, owned by one of our female Kalinagos, where she has gone into preparing indigenous foods for visitors and tourists. So our Kalinago women are very much engaged in culinary arts within the Kalinago territory and also pass it on to their children. The importance of women and the environment. And I will quote from the UNDP 2011. Women's participation in decision making at higher levels has specifically benefited environmental policy such that countries with more women in their parliaments are more likely to set aside protected land areas and ratify international environmental treaties. In fact, new data reveals that there is a causal relationship between forest depletion, air pollution, and other measures of environmental degradation are also high. End of quote. Currently, within the Kalinago territory, we have 93 registered female farmers. And they are very active in assisting their husbands and their family growing their herbs and their local crops. Currently, we have two female herbalists who do it for commercial purposes as well. And here in this picture, we have our Kalinago students engaged in agricultural activities at the primary school level. Current challenges and threats to our Kalinago culture, traditions, and knowledge we have the influences of changing knowledge systems. The internet is also becoming a widespread use, and our Kalinago youth, youth get exposed to these um, new systems and new practices that they follow. We also have our education system that is oftentimes not indigenous friendly. Majority of our indigenous schools within the Kalinago territory do not have a curriculum that um, showcases our culture, and therefore, this is lacking. Also, we have increasing urbanization of our indigenous people. Many of our indigenous people work out of the territory, and therefore, this prevents them from practicing their culture um, as freely as they would if they were living within. And of course, we have the loss of our traditional resources. In conclusion, I say that the Kalinago territory has no physical infrastructure called a museum. However, the women and children have been contributors to the sustenance of culture over the years, and they continue to do so. While Sue may function as a living museum, it is critical that we develop a space where we can preserve historical traditional resources and knowledge that would be easily accessible to everyone and reduce the threat of extinction. Also, it is critical that the museum, and I hope that Mark, will help remove these misconceptions about indigenous women's role in the community. I thank you. Thank you, Senator Annette Sanford. We move to our third presenter, Mr. Claudius Sanford. Mr. Claudius Sanford, holds a Master's of Arts degree in Economics and Public Sector Administration from the University of Arkansas as a Fulbright Scholar and a Bachelor of Science degree in Economics and Management from the University of the West Indies as a Sir Arthur Lewis Scholar. He is presently the head of the Business Department at the Dominica State College where he lectures in the economics department. He served as a primary and a secondary school teacher and a sports administrator before serving as an opposition senator in the House of Parliament. He is an active community member and remains an avid sportsman and farmer. 
Welcome, Mr. Claudius Sanford. Mabrika, everyone. Um, let me say thank you to Mark for allowing me the opportunity to present here on my topic, the economic of museums. Um, I'm here today to make the case that museums serve as a very integral component in any community or country, especially the Kalinago territory, in sustaining the resilient components of our livelihood and as well contributing to the economic welfare of the state and also of our community. Um, currently, we see that museums are becoming more important in the region. And we say that against the backdrop that our, our service sector, which is the tourism sector of, of most of our economies, have shifted towards a uh, 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 service type model moving away from our traditional agricultural based um, um, economy. Um, the significance of, of, of museum can be looked at from the four aspects. They play a significant role in leisure activities, tourism attraction, and research. Now, consumers, according to the research online, consumers spend substantial amount of money visiting museums, both in terms of admission fees and expenditure in museum restaurants and shops. So the bulk of the money that like, tourists would spend in museums would go to the, 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 the admission fees, but a lot of it spent around the, the, the circumference of those museums through the restaurants and, and other attraction areas in that, in that site. According to the American Alliance of Museum, the AMM, in the United States, museums contribute 50 billion US dollars to the economy and generate approximately 850 million visitors in 2019. Now, why I choose to use this little piece of data here is that I'm saying that against the backdrop that the Caribbean region, most of its tourist visitors come from the United States. And if we put this into a, a contextual um, understanding, we'll see that the, the majority of the, the, the tourists who come from the States, we can say that a good percentage of them would also have interest in visiting some of our museums. And as such, the significance of museums within the Caribbean region becomes focal here. And um, as you can see in the picture I have, there is one of the Jamaican museums, and I tried my best for this presentation to highlight some of the museums in the Caribbean. So throughout my slides, I, I tried my best to get some of the, the museums in the region. Now, if I were to, to, to allow myself to, to believe that I'm speaking to people who are very knowledgeable about museums, the, the type of information I'm going to put forward there would be common knowledge. However, I'm assuming that I'm speaking to people who know nothing about museums in the region, but who have the vision to ensure that in our own little um, community or the Carnago territory, we can envision and conceptualize some kind of museum. Although, from my earlier, my, my colleagues would have made mention that the Carnago territory itself is a living museum, and it's really the, the, the heart of true resilience, seeing that we have you know, we fought of the European colonization, post-emancipation, post-independence. We are now still, you know, in the struggle for our own identity and our own authority. We have to deal with so many dividing forces of religion and politics, and we have never been able, you know, to find that kind of unity to, to, to chart our own goals and, and determine, you know, self-determine our own path of development. So I, I believe museums here bringing, you know, these, these people from different thinking and philosophies together is a, a way forward for that kind of unity we need. So the information I present in here, again, I'm assuming that no one knows it, but let's see how that goes. So I start with looking at the types of museums. Museums are classified according to the following criteria. One, content. The first um, criteria content, museum may contain arts, historical artifacts, scientific objects, and or many other exhibits of general and sometimes very specific interest. And as you see there, the picture here of some of the Kalinago um, artifacts of, 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 of pre-colonialization time and post-colonialization, some of their, their writing and their transcripts are in here. And there are museums who are, are, are set up just to showcase those, those kind of content. The other type of museum would go by its size. And some museums are huge and draw thousands of visitors a day from far and near. 
orders are small, have few visitors, are run by amateur staff, have very restricted opening hours, and are only of local interest. And again, this is significant in the context of our discussion here, because in conceptualizing the museum, we, we can choose to go for the content material or the, or the, or the size, and, um, and in that case, we can see the, the size really doesn't matter. You could have huge structures, whereas you could have very small, specific structures with restricting hours based on the purpose that you need. So it's, it's just a matter of creating that, that mindset, that kind of thinking process as we tend to want to visualize something of reality for the Karnago territory or Dominica. Another type is, is gone by the age. Some museums lay claim to a long and distinguished history and are often situated in very old buildings, while others are newly founded and may impress visitors with their spectacular architecture. And again, this is very important in the context of the Caribbean and MAC, the, the, the Association of Caribbean Museum, because we may have the remnants of slavery and some of these old buildings that we may want to use in, in putting forward some kind of you know, museum, some kind of um, showcasing of some of those traditions and cultures. But in the, in the, in the context of the Kalinago territory, I believe we need, since that we have lost most of that, we need to regenerate some of those um, archaeological and even architectural um, designs and come up with something that is unique that will be placed within our environment that will tell our story, tell our struggle, tell our survival. So again, this is placed here so we can, we can have you know, that, that kind of thinking. The third one there, the, the last one in the types is the institutional form. Traditional European museums have been public, even forming part of the normal government administration. And I brought up before mention of the European type style union that are very cold and, and, and cannot really express the trueness of what is really going on. And, and here we see that again, most of the traditional um, type museums, even in the Caribbean, tend to reflect that European style um, thing. However, there have also been private museums, and this picture of the, of the Bob Marley Museum is, 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 is showcased here to say that we can also have something private. And once we have a kind of governmental structure, a public aspect to our, the management of stuff, you lose some of the authority that you have. So in the context of our Kalinago people and our contribution to the history and the culture of the region, if we were to envision you know, something of a museum style, which we, we already started with the, the um, Carib Kalinago Barana Ote, which is one, a, a step towards that direction. It has to be something that is very unique and speaks to our language and our culture and our struggles. Functions of museum. So functions of museum is important, again, from an economic perspective. Despite the various differences in the museums, all museums share a, some particular and similar function. So from one end, a museum may be looked as an economic unit that is a firm providing a certain service. And as I said, based on the content and all the rest, the history and all that stuff, or it could, it, you know, it could provide other services like you, know, you could go into the art forms, painting and, and, and films. So it, it is an economic unit. So that is one of the functions. However, there's a second function to, to, to museums. And the second one is applying an economic way of thinking to museum involved assuming that individuals pursue their utility within the constraint imposed by institutions and the environment, especially where resources are scarce. So again, we look at it as a service, but it could also be a utility where people come, not necessarily just to look at the, the, the structure and the artifacts on a leisure trip, but they may come to learn and ut utilize some of the knowledge that they gain from visiting the museum. So we see there that the function of museum could be a very strict um, business perspective, but it could also have that social learning and um, empowering aspect to it. Now I move on to the next topic, which, we call, which I call the demand for museums. And that again links to what I said earlier, when, you come, when we talk about the utility of a, of, of a resource, it also comes with the demand. So based on the utility you get, that determines the kind of demand you'd want for such. So there are two types of demand for museum. The first one, which I call the private demand, and that is pure dollars and cents. The admission fee, and then we go into the opportunity cost and the price of alternative. And the opportunity cost here speaks, okay, what else could the resources be used for instead of putting it into the development or the advancement of a museum? What other alternatives could bring greater economic dollars and cents back to the people investing in such, which could be the government or the private sector? And the second one, which I want to spend a little time on, is the social demand, that is the external effects. Museum creates social values beyond 
dollars and cents. And these include the option value enjoying the value of the exhibit. Just go in there and enjoying the painting, the films, those um, art, um, artifacts from yesteryear, and just relating in a very spiritual way to the stories of those ancestors or, or, or events that happened at Unshokis. You have the existing value. People feel happy that museum exists. Like in, our, in our case, if we were to construct a museum in the Kalinago territory, even if we do not visit it because we, we live that life, but we are just happy that it, it exists and, and we have achieved some accomplishment. You have the bequest value, where descendants enjoy the museum in the future. So again, we know we did something that our children can learn from and they can develop even further by using innovation and creativity and move to future generations. And then you have the prestige value, outside outsiders enjoy and value the museum in the community. The whole tourist figure, we have them coming in and they can be part and enjoy our culture and at the same time leave something behind that can sustain our livelihood. And the last area is the educational value. People are aware that museums contribute to their own or to others people's sense of culture and value it because of that. So again, the museum here can serve as an educational tool. You, you, somebody comes in there, they learn about the struggles of the Kalinago people through a certain piece of artifacts. That can um, inspire their, 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 their imagination. They can go write a story, develop a film, you know, tell the, 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 the struggle of the Kalinago people in a more modernized, more catchy way using modern technology and all that, that kind of stuff. So as I conclude, I say all this to say what? And what, the first thing is that museums have great economic value. They bring in money into our economy, and we have an opportunity now to create a model that will merge the Kalinago spirituality and marriage to nature to help educate us on the value of nature for human existence. So again, the, the, uh, a museum now can be used not just to showcase artifacts, but it can help learn and develop an appreciation for nature and our own spirituality. And that in itself will ensure resilience and sustainability. Secondly, the region has an opportunity to construct and develop the industry considering the types appropriate for its strategic goals especially with an indigenous Kalinago tribe nested in the region. So Mark has been doing what it's doing, but here we, from our perspective in the Kalinago territory, who, is, who has lived the struggle, we are giving you now an opportunity to engage us and let us see if we can create a product that is unique to the Kalinago str struggle and, and which will also help rebuild our livelihood and, and our, 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 some of our practices that will take us closer to preserving nature and creating something in the region that is that is worth, you know, is very, very, very useful. And thirdly, in regards to the demand for museum, the development of the industry can merge both private economic benefits and social benefits to create multifaceted institutions within the region. So the universities, our schools, our history books, we can now start looking at those, and, and as my, 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 my brother said earlier, let us change the narrative that has, that has been living about we the Kalinago people and let us look at the Kalinago people from our perspective and that will influence institutional changes and, and, and so on. This approach will preserve existing artifacts and object commodities while at the same time creating avenues for regeneration of culture, practices, creation of modern day interpre interpretations and construct of history. And um, I think my brother said it earlier, we need to find ways and I think my sister said it earlier to through our education system to empower our Kalinago people by telling them the true history and not that of the Europeans. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Sanford. This was another brilliant presentation. Our next presenter is Honorable Kozia Fedrick. Honorable Kozia P. Fedrick is a married father of two, a researcher, educator, martial artist, musician, and visual artist, whilst being a member of the parliament and minister responsible for environment, rural modernization, and Kalinago upliftment in Dominica. He served on the reparation committee, was a development officer and school teacher, and holds a BA honors degree in history, political science from the University of the West Indies. He has presented and written extensively on Kalinago heritage was the country coordinator of the International Caribbean Ties Exhibition produced in the Netherlands in 2019 and a co-curator of the Kalinago Our Lives Exhibition 
Smithsonian Museum of North American Indian in 2003-2004. I now present to you Honorable Kozia Frederick. Mabrika, I'm delighted to be part and parcel of Max Conference this year as a Kayanago Brave and a rightful citizen of the entire region and to provide a Kayanago perspective on resilience and sustainability within a circle of highly skilled researchers, cultural activists, and icons. I will spare no time in delving into our cultural resource and the limited trappings of our spirituality and will also highlight that there are no major museums within our jurisdiction. I am proposing to introduce for acceptance by researchers some new terminologies that best credit my ancestors and which should form part of the new narrative. Dominica should be Waiti Kubuli. The Caribbean, the Kalinago Archipelago. Kalinago Chief, Ubutu. Hello, Mabrika. Discovery, Invasion. South America, the Southern Mainland. These are a few of the new names and terminologies that should be part of the narrative moving forward. The terms resilience and sustainability are essentially concepts which can be derived from the very existence of the Kalinago, especially after surviving genocide and the denigration of culture and language through invasions and colonization. This is our history. The justification for claiming resilience and sustainability as Kalinago is indeed embedded in our history. Before the common era, there's an abundance of information on the Kalinago archipelago that provides sufficient evidence to proclaim that there was the existence of peoples within our region of the world for an extended period of time. These confirm that before the invasions of our lands, referred to by scholars as pre-Columbian, the area was a heavily populated area. For instance, Samuel M. Wilson details that over 6,000 years ago, people took the bold step of paddling their canoes out beyond the horizon of the Caribbean and they were well rewarded with a, a large, rich, and uninhabited chain of islands that stretched over 1,500 1, kilometers with more than 200,000 square miles of land. It was revealed to have been the last large area of what we know as the Americas to be explored and consisted of lands with their own peoples, and way of lives as varied and diverse as any other areas in the world. From an archaeological perspective, it has generally been mapped and understood that the ancestors of the present day Kalinago, as the last movement of pre colonial explorers into the archipelago, traversed the seas in dugout canoes between the southern mainland and the islands. And in the wake of the explorations and settlements, much of the exchanges left significant marks on the historiography of various islands of the archipelago. Comrades, friends, there is indeed archaeological evidence. From a cultural and political view, there were forms of, of Kalinago social structures 
which included governance with all the trappings of leadership and succession, which was also inclusive of, of cultural and traditional beliefs, modes of education, and development of basic infrastructures. The general logical evolutionary structure of the Karinago defines us, one, as primarily operating under the classification of banned societies, which would eventually evolve into tribal societies and toward the end resulting in chiefdoms. Friends, comrades, colleagues, there is anthropological evidence. Resistance to colonization became apparent and efforts of European invasions were repeated with similar responses of indigenous resistance over several hundred years. All the colonial records suggest that the invading European forces endeavored to destabilize and eventually rid the region of the Karinago, a people existence with governance structures, a language, traditional practices, a cosmogony, military prowess, and social norms. Friends, comrades, colleagues, the Karinago resisted the invasions. This proclamation is based on the evidence available in the very chronicles of the explorers and missionaries who all served the mercenary intents of an emerging mercantilist system while discrediting the true nature of a Karinago civilization. In support of this perspective, it has been elucidated by Hilary Beckles that due to their irresistible military resistance, the Karinago were targeted first and established in the minds of all Europeans as not the noble savage, but rather as the vicious cannibal. Waitikubuli was a difficult island to conquer for more than 200 years and was left to the Karinago by the Treaty of Eau de la Chapelle in 1748. This treaty was broken. The island was then ceded to Britain by the Treaty of Paris in 1763 and the Royal Proclamation established, and I quote, a government of Grenada, end of quote managed by one governor and one legislature for the group with jurisdiction over Grenada, the Grenadines, St. Vincent, Tobago, and our island, Waitikubuli. It is affirmed that during that time, Waitikubuli had become the refuge for the Karinago, retreating from a number of islands in the Les Antilles, more specifically, those where the surge of French English, Dutch colonization was sweeping them off their ancestral lands. The evident topography of the island, its rugged mountains, thick forests, and harsh coastline provided a natural stronghold for any form of retreat from an invading force. Additionally, a network of trails, lookout points, and offensive positions were also established by the Kalinago, which later proved very useful for slave resistance. It appears that the plight of the Kalinago on the island was similar to that of others on St. Vincent, and the natural response to this circumstance was the spread of printed propaganda in Europe, painting the people as warlike and cannibals, deserving annihilation. All the trappings of survival and resistance resulted in the illegal identification of the people within a described area. The Karago territory was established on, on July 4, 1903 for the descendants of the indigenous people as the Carib Reserve. My people resided in the general area have 
historically been incorrectly referred to as the Caribs. We had settlements all over the island prior to European invasions. Names of many of our villages remain to this day as part of the Creole dialect, a positive cultural resource. During the British rule, the district was generally referred to as the Carib Quarter. It was basically said to comprise of a number of scattered houses in and around a place called Salibia. Various land demarcations during that period expresses its expansion. Our history speaks of resilience because it means basically the capacity to, to recover quickly. In order to survive within the jurisdiction of a colonial state structure, we exercise a sovereign right to self-determination. We function within a communal society centered on subsistence farming, weaving, and fishing. Our trade was done through bartering goods, and we gave community service called Kudme. This resilience eventually caused a conflict between Kalinago and the central government authorities. During a skirmish, my great granddad and my great granduncle were killed, and others accused and, and detained for allegedly smuggling goods out of the neighboring French departments in canoes on September 19th, 1930. The outcomes? The functional leadership referred to as a Carib chief was, uh, was abolished. He was banned from calling himself chief. Emblems of power, the staff and land title were confiscated, and the offices were only reestablished as part of the local government system in 1952. At the point of the island's political independence from Britain in 1978, the area was reaffirmed in Article 41 and 42 of the Carib Reserve Act. The act provided for the general land tenure and the observation and observance of internal self-governance and made provision for the identification of legal boundaries and the establishment of a Kailago chief, an Ubutu, and a council. The communal land arrangements allowed for the Kanago Council to be the second largest landowner after the government. The people are also the sole citizens of the country unable to hold private lands and to use such a document as collateral for procuring loans at the commercial institutions. Sustainability is the capacity to endure. And so the Kanago com community continues to be self-sufficient uh, there are relatively no significant private enterprises for large employment and all the production of competitive goods and services. This is as a result of the commercial banking institutions need for land as collateral. In order to survive within the modern era, our people have taken up traditional domestic industries which have survived the, the sands of time. The Kanago Baranote is established within the prime real estate of the community and as a tourism-oriented facility is the closest to a museum within the heritage. Our so-called primitive practices employed by the Kayanago for centuries are, are sustainable activities and protect our trust assets for future generations. They include rainwater harvesting, composting, wooden architecture, basket weaving, and canoe building. Many folks use herbal medicines on a daily basis, and so herbal gardens are prevalent. Farmers and fishermen rely heavily on the moon and stars and use the ancient lunar calendar to determine activities. There has to be some cost of actions that I propose to the mark. Action one, there must be a detailed examination and, and, and the piecing together of all relevant archaeological evidence on the kind of people as it relates to their existence on the island and there has to be a repatriation of artifacts as an essential part of preserving the heritage. Action two, there must be a detailed examination on the piecing together of all re relevant anthropological evidence. This will help revive traditional governance and spiritual practices. Action three, there must be a detailed exam examination of socioeconomic, cultural, and political history of the Carago, beginning with the British rule in 1783, throughout the legal establishment of the Carib Reserve and in, into the 1903, and of course the community has continued to forge to become a significant part of our Dominican society. A solution, a better appreciation of the Carago heritage 
is, is that it has to be introduced as a resilient and sustainable practice. We can do so for an extensive examination of all European and Caribbean historical records and the Kanago oral history and tradition that will efficiently inform the condition of the people at varying periods of our history. Thank you. I wish to thank Honorable Kozia Frederick for another brilliant presentation. There's a lot of food for thoughts in there. And to the panelists too, they did a wonderful job, all of, all, all of you, and um, very enlightening. And I believe it will be a, a good platform for some brilliant questions and answers from our audience. The Ihora Communities of Excellence Foundation wishes to thank the Museum Association of the Caribbean for allowing us to participate in this year's conference. Thank you to GIS for allowing us to record this program here this morning. Thank you to the technicians. And we want to thank again in a very special way the members of our panel. We thank you first, first of all for accepting the invitation to, um, to participate in, this, in today's activity. We thank you for making the time to do the necessary research and the preparations. And so we know that it took some time from you. And so we want to express our gratitude to you profoundly. And we want to thank you for making the time again and for being ready for today's preparations. So thank you to Jared Langley as well and Mrs. Langley. Thank you for the production this morning. And thank everybody for making today's production successful. And it's back to me now. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. I must say, really, really must say thank you to the Ayahora Communities of Excellence for having put together this group of, I mean, this was a really, really great panel. We have, we've had some fantastic um, comments in the chat and if you have a chance to read them please do so after i'm talking to the panelists here just to, i don't know if any of you have any questions but i have a few questions here that i picked up and i just want to run it by you um the first comment that i would like to run by you is i have kasike kalan of the jamaican Hummingbird Taino group, who you must know, um, wishes a thank you for dismantling the Eurocentric history of our indigenous peoples. So I think, um, I mean, it, this, con it, this started with Lewis, and I think all of you in some way um, spoke about, you know, this, you know, we have to, we have to set our history. We have to tell, we have to tell our history. And until we tell our history, other people will be telling it for us. One question, and I don't know, and I think it was um, if uh, the minister was there, we might have asked the question that maybe one of you might know. Any plans for repatriation of artifacts? I am not aware of any uh, initiatives by either the government or uh, civil society to have artifacts repatriated to Dominica, as far as I, I understand. That is one of the reasons that I mentioned it in my presentation, that the persons who are and organizations who are involved in the museum uh, industry in the Caribbean uh, should be making a concerted effort to have all of the artifacts um, that were removed from all of the Caribbean islands and not just the, not just Dominica uh, returned uh, to those islands uh, for for the proper viewing and and 
examination of, of, of their own peoples and governments. So I, I think that is something that not just MAC, but Caribbean governments really fundamentally should be pursuing that because I, I think they would have a lot more impact on the institutions that hold these artifacts um, quite illegally as far as I'm concerned. Thank you. Do we know? Do we know where these artifacts are? Well, there are many uh, indigenous artifacts all over Europe, in England, in Spain, in, in France. Um, the the church and the in Rome holds artifacts um, from indigenous persons, um, communities, and civilizations. So these things are spread out all all over all over the all over the, all over Europe, um, essentially. Um, and I think in in the pursuit of of, of, of developing museums in the Caribbean, um, maybe some research should be should uh, should be done on that. Thank you, Lewis. And another question, and whom whoever sees uh, thinks that they can answer: How can we further the conversation of decolonization in the Kalinago territory? and in the larger Caribbean community. Is that just I, will, I, will, uh, I can maybe attempt to answer this one. Um, I, I, I personally don't believe um, the conversation has to be, to be furthered. I believe it's, it's about time for action and um, I believe the Kalinago territory now in its capacity, both human and its physical capacity, can now begin to take authority over some of its of its um, activities. For example, in the education system, I, I, I don't believe we need further conversation about what the Kalinago children should learn at the primary school level. I believe the authority of the Kalinago people can be can be uh, can be utilized there by by starting some kind of grassroots movement, grassroots activity at the school level to start re you know reintroducing our version of the of our, our own history because we have within the Kalinago territory now the human capacity to you know to do the necessary research and regenerate and reconstruct our history and start in you know. Um, getting into the minds of our students what the struggles of the ancestors were and, and, and in so doing, they too can carry that touch into the future. So I, I believe, while I understand from, from the question that their conversation has to be broadened, but I believe from, 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 the, from the origin, from the heart, from the nucleus of the problem, which is in the Kalinago territory, it has to be now more than a conversation. It has to be action, it has to be grassroots action. That's, that's from my opinion. Thank you very much, Claudia. So we are moving. We are moving forward now. We are now moving into action. Someone else has something to add? Yeah, if I may just add something uh, to what uh, Claudia has, has mentioned. On the issue of decolonization in the Caribbean on, 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 on a larger scale, um, Claudia is absolutely correct about the Kalanago territory, but in the Caribbean, so colonization didn't just affect uh, the Kalinago people, it, it had a significant impact on, on African slaves who were brought uh, to this part of the world. And what I have been totally amazed by is the fact that although Caribbean islands are run by the descendants of slaves and, 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 and indigenous peoples, what we have essentially continued to do is to, is to institute systems and policies that are totally European centric. We, we have not gone on a systemic and, and concerted effort to change this whole white mentality that governs the Caribbean from, from colonization. What are governments do? Look at our education system. We have a CXC system that is based on an old GCE system that came out of, out of Europe. What are Caribbean governments doing about totally radicalizing the education system and I think that's where it begins. If we are going to decolonize and to get rid of all this colonial um, literature from our school, it begins with the education system. People who are at high levels in the education system of the Caribbean have to, have to get rid 
of the systems which we inherited from, from colonial masters and, 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 and craft a new direction for, for our own education and to begin to rewrite our history, as you had stated earlier. Until we do that, then we are simply perpetuating the history that colonizers have, have, have burdened us with. Thank you. And um, I just have two last questions for you. Um, a statement um, before the question. Uh, Christy and the Floor Arts is having an auction causing a lot of frustration among the Taino community selling, and I'm going to be using the word that um, I think it was um, Mr. Cozier said, um, rather than saying selling pre-Columbian artifacts, we would say pre-invasion artifacts. Are there any organizations within the Kalinago community that is actively seeking to procure stolen artifacts? And another question is, how do you envision bridging the object focus component of the museum with the living museum component? I will, I will take a lead on this. I, I am pretty sure my brother Hill will assist. Um, currently, we have the Kalinago Barana Ute, which is a, a, a model village of the Kalinago tribe. Um, it's a tourist attraction, and in there, we have a few artifacts um, and um, pictures of, 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 of past, you know, historical pictures of the Kalinago tribe. Um, I am not aware of any um, organized systematic move to get in any of those object artifacts back into the territory. But as, I, as we said earlier, I believe with, with what is happening now with Mark and um, the, the networking that is going on, um, we, can, we can maybe start the action needed to, 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 to get some of those, those areas, um, those artifacts back. As to the second question, it's a, it's a challenge um, and it's a very big challenge as well. It, um, among us here and maybe many other uh, um, people in the Kalinago territory, we have an idea what should be done. We have an idea what is best to be done, at least as an alternative to what is going on. But it is a very difficult challenge. You have the challenge of the socioeconomic challenge where a lot of the, even for example, take a clear, just this example of housing on the Kalinago territory. Because of the socioeconomic status of most of the members of the tribe, we are almost forced to accept gifts, if you want to call it that way, of houses from, say, governments or other donating um, 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 agencies. And usually, we have to accept what we are given. And we, we don't have that, that, that authority or that, that certain level of independence or even what we call self-determination in even putting forward our vision of the houses. For example, would it, wouldn't it have been really beautiful to have um, the Kalinago territory, which is a reservation, it is, it is a, it's a communal land which, which houses the Kalinago tribe. Wouldn't it have been nice that the houses on this reservation would have been you know, so designed architecturally to reflect some of the cultural heritage and some of the cultural values of the tribe in a modern day way to become resist, resilient and resistant to the, to, the, to the hurricanes and other natural disasters. I believe that would be the ideal situation. And many of us have those ideas, we have advocated for it, but the challenge of influencing those decisions when you have uh, governments having a major stake in housing in the Kalinago territory and you have other donor agencies after Mary and after major hurricanes actually giving some assistance, you, you cannot really be beggars and choosers at the same time, right? So, so I, that, that is how I would approach this, the, the second question. Um, there are opportunities left to do that. Um, all is not gone, but it would really take, you know, some very, very attentive leadership and um, partners to accomplish some of that fit. Thank you very much, Claudius. And Irvins, you had a question or an answer for us. Sorry? I, I missed it. Were you addressing me? Yes, yes. 
Oh, okay. You, you had your hand up, so I wanted to acknowledge you and I want and your question or your remark. Oh, just just a remark I want to add there with um, how we, we move um, forward with the conversation. And I wanted to just say that one of one of the good things that's happening right now on the Caribbean level is that coming out of, of some archaeological work that was done by Leiden University, we have put we have an exhibition that is put up now. Um, really addressing how do we how do we move in the future based on the past, and um, this exhibition has has been um, opening at different um, countries. In Saint Martin, it will open up at five o'clock this afternoon, and it stays on wherever it goes for a period of three months. And during that time, it really talks a lot about Kalinago, based on the um, archaeological research that have been done, and a lot of interest is 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 coming out of that on the Caribbean level as far as the, the Kalinago people are concerned. I just wanted to add that piece. Thank you very, very much, gentlemen, ladies. I know we could go on talking, I guess, for hours again. There is so much to say. I mean, the, we are still, this is not history. This is daily life. The Kalinago lives on. You have been resilient. And once again, I'd like to thank you all Thank you all very much for being a part of this morning session. And we look forward, um, Mac looks forward to working with the Kalinago community. So call upon us, the Ayahuara communities of excellence. You made the first step and we'll be doing this work together. Thank you all very much. Thank you for joining this session. If any of our participants have more questions for any of our panelists, please feel free to sign in. You would see on the uh, networking menu on the left-hand side of your screen, you scroll through the list of attendees and presenters and you can start your conversation. So feel free to do so. Stay tuned for our next discussion entitled uh, living with and surviving with the pandemic, which starts at 1.30 p.m. our time. See you all soon. Thank you so much. Thank you all so very much, gentlemen. Thank you. And Thank ladies. you very much for having us. Thank you.